Welcome to my darkroom. Today we're going to talk about some of the enlargers you can get. Um, now you can go on GG and you can go on Craigslist and there's a lot of enlargers you can still pick up for quite a good price. And I say, you know what, if you have the room to store it and if you have a room to be able to make a darkroom, I say go for it. Now, some of the questions you might ask is, what size of enlargers do I want? So you may want to start with something just simple, like I have a 35 millimeter only enlarger that is dedicated to my camera. It's the most precise, small, for perfect for small spaces. But then again, I go all the way to four by five and I do a lot of large format work. When I do a lot of large format work, I like to blow it up and make really big prints. I can go up to 3040 in this darkroom. And uh, so I have some of my enlargers that are set up to make big prints from big negatives. And I have enlargers that are dedicated for black and white. I have enlargers that are de dedicated to color. Now, I don't do color work anymore in my darkroom because now it doesn't make sense anymore. The chemistry being so rare, expensive, and the paper is almost impossible to find. And uh, they really, that's where digital shines and the inkjet, and uh, it's just worth it for the chemical. But for black and white, I'm still really into the darkroom, and I think real photography is still black and white. Let's talk about some of the uh, enlargers and what you can buy. So right here, I have my 35 millimeter only. I wanted a dedicated enlarger because 80% of my work is 35 millimeter and I wanted it the best lens possible and just precision. And I wanted to have an enlarger where it could be fixed at the same spot and really not move and just always be ready for a quick 35 millimeter print that is really sharp and beautiful. Now the Leica enlargers are made by Durst. Uh, they are autofocus enlargers. Uh, most of them have European plugs. Try to look to make sure that there's a, a box that comes with it to regulate the electricity. Because of course enlargers work with light bulbs and they dim with electricals up and downs and surges. So what you want to do is you want to regulate the electricity before it reaches the enlarger to make sure that the light is always consistent. So here we have my second enlarger, which is the Devere. It's a drop bed enlarger. So it's made to actually have the table. All you have to do is pull this down. The whole table goes down. So what I'm doing now is if I need to do really big prints, this is my enlarger. Um, I just drop the bed all the way to the floor and then bring the enlarger head all the way up and I can do 30, 40, even from four by five negatives, uh, 35 millimeter negatives, two and a quarter, everything. So this is kind of my workhorse. It's not pretty, but it sure is consistent. There's, um, the light source of enlargers is something we also have to talk about. My little Leica enlarger has one bulb. So it's one bulb that's being diffused by a diffusion box. The diffusion box is basically, think of it as a frosted plexi, so that it basically shines through a box that eliminates a frosted plexi, and so the light is really even all around. Most of them have little halogen bulbs. Now this one, for example, the Devere, because it's made to do really large prints, there's two bulbs, a bit like a V engine if you want. There's one going this, this direction, there's one going this direction. So I have double the output of light, which I really need when you start doing big prints. And it's still the same. It's still a diffusion enlarger. Uh, all the enlargers I have set up in my darkroom now are the diffusion enlargers. Um, the main reason why I use diffusion is because uh, fine scratches, um, even light, even fine scratches kind of disappear because the diffusion has a tendency to even out the imperfections on the negatives. So you're losing a little bit of the sharpness of the grain, but you're gaining um, even light and you're gaining a lot. Now there's enlargers that are what they call condenser enlargers, which are the really old school enlargers, which is literally a light bulb like you would find in the uh, a good old Edison bulb that goes through a bunch of lenses and goes straight onto the negative. Uh, they are the sharpest enlargers. Um, they are the contrastier enlarger because every light spectrum has a different contrast range for black and white paper. 
but everything that exists on your negatives will show up, including dust, hair, scratches. So your negatives have to be perfect. And uh, the light is uneven also because it's a bare bulb shining through optics. You get spotty lighting on the, on the baseboard. So you're always trying to use the optimum of the lens, the optimum bulb, the right wattage, and end it all to, for it to be consistent. My third enlarger is what they call the color closed loop enlarger. It's an Omega enlarger. Um, I bought this one for the simple reason that I needed to do really consistent color work. Uh, closed loop enlarger is basically a color analyzer built into the housing of the top of the enlarger. And in there, there's a computer that reads the level of the color. So if you say 50 magenta and your light bulb is dyed 5%, it will correct the magenta so that the output is exactly the same color. I wanted to be able to have color corrections and keep them for a long period of time. Um, usually papers were inconsistent, color papers were inconsistent from batch to batch, but in the later years of Kodak or Fuji, I could, within, you know, three points of magenta or red, you know, I could actually manage the, the prints and, and keep tight control over it. So it's perfect for contact sheets, perfect for high level color printing and high output. And it's a very, it's also a four by five. Um, they all have different lenses. So this one, for example, has a turret on it where I have two lenses. I have my 90 millimeter and then you go like this and turn it and uh, then we have the uh, actually I have it all set up here so basically it turns around and you get to pick which lens you want so this is my 135 I like that all my enlargers are really manual and uh, all this stuff really holds together well for this bit but it's uh it's quite they're really reliable uh, make sure that when you buy the enlarger you look at uh, what the bulb number is and what the wattage is and make sure they're still available because there's some like enlargers out there that used to have different bulbs and now they're impossible to find they're just fancy paperweights so before you buy any equipment just make sure you can find probably this enlarger here for 200 bucks on kijiji uh, the Devere is rare, but uh, we've, you know, you can still find some really good deals. A lot of shops that used to have professional darkrooms have closed down and some of the schools have closed them down too. So you can still find a pretty good deal in some storage unit somewhere. I'm sure there's tons of them hiding. So good luck on the hunt. So the other part about the darkroom is the way I have it organized. So the way I have it organized, I have the dry side, which is all my enlargers. I have my papers underneath. Uh, I keep some dry chemicals on this side, the dry compounds that I use, potassium ferrocyanide and all kind of dry developers. And then on the other side, I have all the wet stuff. So my chemistry, my trays. Um, I use a temperature gauge directly on the, on the plumbing. So I know I can regulate the temperature and make sure that everything is always on the go. To wash prints, it's simple. I have two, uh, two systems going on. I have, for the really large prints, I use the entire sink, where I will literally use the entire sink to make the print, and I would roll them and always keep them rolled and always just rush the water through. Uh, for 1620 and 2024, this is what I do here. I have a Kodak Siphon, and I have a tray, and I have, I always keep a very minimum, minimal amount of prints in there just to make sure that the, it gets washed thoroughly because it's, I don't want no cross contamination coming in all the time. So uh, that's what I do. And otherwise underneath all this, I have this, um, the print washer for 1114 and smaller. So the print washer is a vertical washer and it has basically compartments in it so that everything would be separated from one from the other. So a uh, great way to do uh, fiber base. For RC prints, I also do on in this tray because 
RC prints get washed in like between one minute and four minutes. More than that, that's not worth it. Less than that, it's not getting washed properly. So a, a lot of the high output contact sheets or whatever is running through RC paper, it's getting washed with the siphon. And I'm trying to keep this strictly for fiber-based paper and uh, that's it.